Hello everybody, good afternoon. We are on the CSI TV this afternoon, which is a part of the CSI Mumbai 2018 initiative. And I have with me none other than Professor A. John Cam. To me, it sounds like a dream come true. We have grown up reading his articles, listening to him in conferences, but this time I have, in, have him right in front of me. Uh, welcome, Professor John Cam. And the assignment we have is to discuss a little bit of it, contemporary issues in atrial fibrillation. Well, let me say it's a pleasure to be here and I'm ready for your questions. I feel honored. <laughs> what more can I say? Uh, my question is, why are we talking about atrial fibrillation more than we did probably about a decade or so earlier? Uh, is there the prevalence that is rising? Is the etiology different? Are the patients surviving longer? Why do we talk AF much more in daily practice and uh, conferences maybe? Well, I think it's very important to appreciate that uh, 30 or 40 years ago, atrial fibrillation was regarded as an acceptable alternative to normal sinus rhythm, particularly mm -hmm. in elderly patients. It took us a long time to realize that atrial fibrillation was associated with increased mortality, with increases in stroke, with worsening heart failure, with increased sudden death, with dementia and so on. And now that we have this information, of course, we're looking much more for atrial fibrillation. But as you know, atrial fibrillation is a disease which is largely seen in the elderly population. True. And the demographics are changing so that we have more and more elderly patients. So because of that, of course, we are seeing more and more atrial fibrillation. As well, of course, uh, patients with underlying heart disease are treated very well, but their disease is not totally eradicated, it's just ameliorated, and they live longer. And the combination of living longer with underlying cardiovascular disease means inevitably that we see far more atrial fibrillation. So very true. I think in India we simultaneously face atrial fibrillation even in a younger population because of still much presence of rheumatic heart disease, particularly then maybe mitral valve disease. Dr. John Cam, you gave us the clinical classification of atrial fibrillation so that all of us could speak the same language. You said we should say paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, persistent atrial fibrillation and permanent atrial fibrillation. So we left behind the acute and the chronic thing. And later on there was a modification that came and uh, we started calling something as long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. Now, what is the difference between this and a uh, AF of a lesser duration? What is the difference in the pathophysiology, in the substrate or in the therapeutics that we need to understand? Well, this concept of long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation came about for two reasons. Firstly, because it was appreciated that permanent atrial fibrillation was in the days of cardiac ablation merely a decision on the part of the doctor or the patient to allow the atrial fibrillation to continue. So persistent atrial fibrillation might be persist for a few months or it may be allowed to persist for a much longer period of time. And we might have called it permanent atrial fibrillation. But then the doctor or the patient realizes that they might be converted back into sinus rhythm by an ablation procedure, for example. And when that is said, then clearly you're no longer agreeing that the atrial fibrillation is permanent. It is persistent, if you like, but it's long-standing. Now, the second reason that we have to, I think, distinguishing, distinguish long-standing or persistent, uh, long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation from persistent atrial fibrillation is the fact that as the disease progresses, more and more fibrosis occurs in the atrium and the condition does become more difficult to treat. Now many doctors would like to abandon the concept of the temporal description of atrial fibrillation in favor of talking about the atrial fibrillation burden, the total duration of time spent in atrial fibrillation and they'd like to back that up with information about atrial remodeling so, for example, how much fibrotic tissue there is in the atrium, the size of the atrium, and so on and so forth. 
So I think there's going to be a move towards a different form of classification. But currently, as you say, we're talking about paroxysmal persistent, long-standing persistent and permanent atrial fibrillation. That's so very nicely explained, Dr. Kahn. Uh, while we talk of this uh, patients with a very high AF load, there are some of the AFs that are detected through an implantable electrical device. We have a lot of pacemakers, ICDs, CRTDs being implanted. And when you follow them up, you detect the atrial high rate episodes. Now, when should these be counted as clinically significant? When do you act on them? Well, that is a really interesting question because, of course, the more you look, the more you will find. And if the patient is only suffering from very short episodes of atrial fibrillation, if you're monitoring continuously as you are with an implantable device, then you will pick up those short episodes of atrial fibrillation which would rarely be detected in a clinical environment in a patient that's not being monitored continuously. Right. Now that means that we're seeing a lot more patients with atrial high rate episodes and we do not know the implications as far as stroke, for example, is concerned. So you'll remember the ASSERT trial that reported that six minutes of atrial fibrillation or atrial high rate episodes above 190 beats per minute identified a group of patients with a 2.5 fold increase in the likelihood of atrial fibrillation compared with those who hadn't got these episodes. And the absolute risk, however, was only 1.6% per annum for stroke or systemic embolism. Now, 1.6% per year is rather marginal for, uh, for prescribing antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Uh, you need something of that order or above to justify giving a vitamin K antagonist, it might be sufficient to warrant giving a NOAC drug. So we need to know whether it is worth anticoagulating these patients. Now one other sideline piece of information is that uh, if you look at that assert data, you find that only the patients who had rather longer than six minutes, in fact, they had to have about 24 hours of continuous atrial fibrillation before they seemed to suffer oh, yeah. an ischemic stroke. <clears throat> and remember, there's very little clear relationship between the timing of the fibrillation on the device mm -hmm. and the stroke itself. That makes sense. Now, so because of all this yeah. problem, <clears throat> we've got a couple of trials going on in which we're trying to identify the value of the anticoagulation. As yet, we don't have an answer. But in the clinic, I'm prescribing anticoagulants if patients have at least 24 hours of atrial fibrillation on an implantable device, but I am not prescribing it if they have less than 24 hours. Right. But of course, if the patient has a pacemaker or a CRTD or an ICT, ICD device, then you can keep following the patients and find out when they do develop longer durations of atrial fibrillation. So does your answer suggest, Professor Cam, that the duration of an AF episode counts more than the burden of AF or the number of episodes in a particular duration? Well, I wish I could answer that question. It's a very good one. We don't know the answer to that question. It may well be that, for example, four episodes of six hours is equivalent to one episode of 24 hours. We don't really know that, but that information will also be given to us from the two trials that are going on at present to try and identify which patients to anticoagulate. So moving from the A counting the AF episodes, let's move on to the substrate part of it. Just like AF is increasing with the age, aging population, heart failure is also increasing with the aging population and those two are married to each other. AF patients have heart failure, heart failure patients have AF. How do you manage AF when you have a heart failure patient? When do you choose a rate control? When do you do a rhythm control? Can you give some distinct uh, principles to do this job? Well, I think first of all, uh, when atrial fibrillation develops in a heart failure patient, the heart failure itself is likely to deteriorate. So you have to institute 
therapy to improve the heart failure as well. Secondly, of course, heart failure plus atrial fibrillation is a definite indication for anticoagulation, so you have to institute adequate anticoagulation. And then you have this very difficult decision about whether you should try and restore sinus rhythm and maintain yeah. sinus rhythm, or whether you would prefer just to control the patient rate. Now, controlling the patient's rate is probably the easy option. It's easier to do that, but of course, there's a limit to the amount of rate control drugs that we can use that are not negatively inotropic. So combinations of, for example, beta blockers and non-dihydropyridine calcium antagonists are not encouraged in heart failure. You might have to choose, for example, digoxin plus a beta blocker or digoxin plus a calcium channel inhibitor. But you don't generally combine all three in right. patients with heart failure. So that's quite difficult. But on the other hand, remember that you can, for example, do his bundle ablation, oh, yeah. then pace the ventricles, usually using a CRT type of pacing. And in those cases, you get very good results. There was a recent trial called APAF CRT at yeah. the ESC that demonstrated very nice results by doing that. Now, turning to rhythm control, you recall that most antiarrhythmics uh, have some negative inotropic Certainly. effect. Yeah. And they can be proarrhythmic, particularly in a heart failure setting. So you have to deal very carefully with them. In heart failure, as far as antiarrhythmics in Europe are concerned, we really only have amiodarone, or if you want to, you yeah. could include beta blockers so in that true. category. But that's all we have. Right. So the, an antiarrhythmic strategy may or may not work. There are some trials that show it's valuable, some trials that show that it's not particularly valuable. Right. So we can, can turn to the ablation concept. Yes. Now, there's not a lot of really good data yet about whether ablation and for atrial fibrillation, that's left atrial ablation, pulmonary vein, isolation, etc., plus or minus more complex forms of ablation. So if well, I may well, interrupt you, Professor Cam, uh, in, UK, in the practice that you see in UK, does it matter who treats AF? Is it the physician or is it the cardiologist uh, that decides in a heart failure patient or even in general AF situation whether he chooses a rate control strategy first or a rhythm control strategy first? Well, often the patients are being primarily looked after by a physician. Yes. And a physician may make the choice to use a, a rhythm, a, a rate control strategy. But if the patient doesn't do well, the patient's then referred That's through right. a cardiologist to perhaps an EP. Right. Correct. So drugs would always remain the corner stay of treating atrial fibrillation. Uh, we probably tend to do AF ablation very reluctantly in this country. There are issues of cost, there are issues of recurrence after ablation, needing more procedures. That limits us from really taking on ablation in a big way. Can you prescribe us real indications where you would say, you would encourage us to take on AF ablation? Where, in which patient of atrial fibrillation should we do AF ablation? Uh, what would you strong what a strong message what kind of strong message would you like to give do you mean specifically in heart failure patients not in heart failure any af patient which ones should we uh, go after in terms of doing an ablation and probably where should we stay away well i think that uh, the general requirement is that the patient has failed an antiarrhythmic drug or two or three antiarrhythmic drugs and that they remain highly symptomatic with their recurrent atrial fibrillation so that, I think, is Symptoms the... Symptoms is the most uh, is, countered thing. That's yeah. a very important criterion. But outside uh, the UK, particularly in the United States, they're moving into asymptomatic patients. They're moving into using ablation as a first-line therapy. Yeah. But uh, we generally... So is there a difference it. between United States and how Europe treats an AF patient uh, in terms of uh, choosing ablation uh, earlier than... Uh, uh, the, and not persisting with the drug therapy too long. Is there a difference between those two worlds? I think there is a difference. And I think that the American procedure, 
might be a better procedure in the sense if it's done earlier, it's likely to be far more successful. Now, we don't have a lot of information about that. We have a little bit of real world, uncontrolled data that suggests that that is true. But we need much more information about that. We have a large trial coming up called the EAST trial that should present results within the next year or 18 months that will give us some information to discuss this in an evidence-based way. Right. So I, I guess uh, it gives me an impression that you don't foresee ablation as a therapy of first choice probably uh, in, the, in the near future. Probably one must attempt use of antiarrhythmic drugs. Uh, it depends on whether you use one drug, whether you use two drugs. and. Probably the most important point that Professor Cam came down with was uh, symptoms are the most relevant thing why you would ablate an AVE. Switching the gears a little bit, one cannot uh, end an AVE discussion or probably one should start an AVE discussion by talking about antithrombotics. Professor Cam has talked and I think even today later he would talk a lot on antithrombotics and NOAX. Uh, it seems that there is an overwhelming evidence to choose NOAX about above VKA drugs to use as oral anticoagulants for patients with AF. This is something I would like to discuss with you. Uh, now, uh, is it that uh, the NOAX are superior to AF uh, to VKA antagonists in all the situations? Where should one still continue with the VKAs? Well, I think generally the DOAC or NOAC drugs are superior to vitamin K antagonists, largely because they reduce intracerebral and intracranial hemorrhage. Right. In some cases, they also reduce ischemic strokes a little further as well. They're easy to take, better quality of life, uh, no need for INR testing and so on. So lots of advantages. But as you rightly say, they're not for everybody. We know, for example, in patients with metallic prosthetic heart valves that a pilot study between a vitamin K antagonist with INR control and uh, dobigatran, that dobigatran did much worse. Yes. Now, I emphasize it was a pilot study. It included a lot of patients who had just had surgery and we don't really know much yet about whether a NOAC could be used in the longer term. And there are plans to look further into that. But for the time being, we do not use NOACs in patients with metallic valves. Right. Now, similarly, we have as yet no compelling evidence about whether we can treat patients with moderate to severe rheumatic mitral stenosis with a NOAC drug. That's not because we have adverse trial information, we just don't have any trial information. Right. But there is, for example, the Invictus program, which is currently going on, which is evaluating the use of rivaroxaban in these patients, and we should have some news soon about whether that's going to be a continuing contraindication to NOAC therapy. Now, there are lots of other groups of patients. For example, let's take patients who have moderately impaired renal function. Many nephrologists and cardiologists prefer to use NOAC drugs in these patients rather than using a vitamin K antagonist. One of the main reasons for that is that uh, vitamin K is required to prevent nephrocalcinosis. And if you use a vitamin K antagonist and compare it to the use of a NOAC over a period of time, then renal impairment becomes much worse That's than the patient taking learning. warfarin, for example. And therefore, the people are beginning to lean much more towards the use of DOAC drugs in that particular population. But other nephrologists like to be able to monitor the anticoagulation okay. status of patients right. and therefore they prefer to use a vitamin K antagonist. So there's a lot of controversy right. in that particular area. When it comes to discussing AF, obviously time would be always uh, in short and I would like to let this keep flowing. There is one last burning question that I want to take with you before uh, we, uh, we 
have we we start thanking you uh, this is about you know starting noac in an af patient who has had a ischemic stroke how do you decide at what time to start the noac a very crisp answer maybe from you well uh, you can start uh, a noac therapy after a tia the very next day right if the, it's a small stroke uh, then you need to wait about 3 days if it's a moderate stroke provided there's no hemorrhagic conversion waiting one week is sufficient so you do a mr again and rule out a hemorrhagic stroke we do an mr at the 7 day point or later at the 14 day point if the patient has had a more severe stroke ischemic stroke so provided there's no hemorrhagic uh, conversion now this is called dina's rule mm -hmm. it's easy to remember 1 3 6 and 12 or 1 okay. 3 7 and 14 right it it's a pretty easy rule to remember and uh, we work with that currently there are studies going on to see whether there's a good evidence base for that we don't have the data yet but we do have intuition that it works pretty well i think uh, as i said if discussion can go on and professor cam can always educate us for as long as we wish to time is always at a premium we said this in this meeting a number of times i wish to thank professor cam for coming to csi mumbai 18 and uh, educating us uh, he is going to continue through this day again and probably we'll see more in india in future meetings we would like to learn from you all the time professor cam thank you very much thank you very thank much you. thank you thanks